This is the Rich Dad Stockcast with Andy Tanner, the show that kicks 401ks in the asphalt and teaches you to be the master of your own stock investing domain. And here's your host, Greg Arthur. All right, welcome to today's show. I, I was kind of thinking that today's show we should call How to Do the Impossible. <laughs> so let me tell you why. Let me tell you a little story. The other day I got into a huge fight with one of my relatives. I, I didn't mean to, but I completely triggered this poor old man. I was talking to him about what I'd been learning on this very podcast, and man, he, his face was furious. His skin turned red from blood pressure elevation. His forehead got all wrinkly, and the heavy frown like smashed his eyes down. And he was yelling so aggressively, like he was spitting all over me. I, I now, didn't realize we were that controversial. This is I, I wasn't even I wasn't even trying to be, but but in his defense, you know, money is a super emotional topic, and. And he starts screaming at me, you can't do that. Because I was talking about what we, what we learned here in stocks. He's like, no one can cash flow from the stock market. It's impossible. Oh. And, and so I took, a, I took what Robert always does. And I was, like, I was like, super cool. Not that Robert's calm. But I was calm. Granted, it was my relative. And I said, you keep saying you can't do that. Don't say I can't do that. And, and it was kind of funny. He, like his his anger like when like just dissipated like i think he turned to shock and and i I don't know if it was shock because i was so calm while he was so mad because that that does freak people out or if it's that he suddenly realized that it was his i can't attitude that was the thing that was keeping him from seeing how to do this but like it was actually pretty funny his mouth was wide open he was speechless and you know a lot of the things we talk about probably our listeners have that same initial reaction that, that, that you can't do that, that you can't create cash flow from stocks. But the reality is that if you understand how to stop seeing stocks as just investments and start looking at stocks as a business, like you're going to talk about today, Andy, then, well, you know what? I don't want to steal your thunder. So let's bring on Andy Tanner. Andy, welcome. Andy is the genius of this podcast. Boy, you must have, uh, you got a pretty low bar if you call me a genius, Greg. We know that. So. I do call you a genius. You the are you are the low. man. <laughs> oh, and, and by the way, Andy, no pressure, but my relative will be listening today. So, Oh, this is, well, this is good. Well, I welcome uh, him because. Uh, Uncle Frank. Yeah, Uncle Frank. It's not about winning an argument. It's um, just about discovering new things and maybe a different perspective and Chances are Uncle Frank will say, oh, yeah, I know that, right? I mean, that's probably what he'll say at the end. He says, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Let's, uh, let's talk about this. Um, there's a sign on my wall right there. All right. Do it? I'm, I'm not in mirror mode. That you're, at, you're at 16. Right there. Right there. All right. And it's a quote by Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger's Warren Buffett's business partner, and uh, he's quite wealthy along with Buffett. And he's in his 90s, so this is a wise old owl. And he said, uh, right here, he says, if all you do, if all you succeed in doing in life is buying a little pieces of paper, right? If all you do is see it in life is getting rich by buying a little piece of paper, it's failed life. Life is much more than being shrewd in wealth accumulation. And what's interesting is sometimes in all this paper on Wall Street, derivatives and carry trades and things, value can get lost real quick. And so if we start by saying, you know, what is an asset? Well, we can look at it selfishly and we can say an asset is something that I buy that puts money in my pocket. And an asset takes money away from me. I mean, look at it from that selfish standpoint. Is what does it do for me? Just, just to correct you, a liability takes money. Or excuse me, did I say an asset? You did. Oh, my fault. An I'm asset, the genius. Yes, I appreciate. That's why we have two of us. <laughs> so, so an asset is something that I buy that I that puts money in my pocket. An asset or a liability is something that I buy that takes money out. And that's a very selfish standpoint. But if you really look at the wealthy, we might talk about investing as a word, in invest. In means I put something in first before I get something out. 
and vest kind of means I'm, I'm vested, I'm, I'm committed, I'm, I'm in there. And so if you look at the people that are wealthy and you can say what you want, there's a lot of rich haters out there. But I'm really grateful for Steve Jobs. Uh, Steve Jobs built this thing called an iPad. And my sons are measurably smarter than I was at that age because they got one as they, about the time they could talk. It was so intuitive for them to just swipe and move. And, and they spend uh, maybe too much screen time. I don't know, but they spend a lot of time learning. Yeah. And yeah. they have a window to the universe you know, through that little thing. And, and I think you blessed it. I love iTunes because when my wife and I go for drive, we have podcasts and we have music. And uh, last night we watched a movie uh, using our Apple TV. So he's brought a lot of value to my life. So let's talk about the value question. Perhaps, um, you know, an asset could also be, hey, this is the way that I bring value to the world. When you are a real estate investor, there's, there's some things people really need on the hierarchy needs, food, clothing, and shelter. And I'm very proud um, to be a landlord. You know, I think of one of the properties we have, I'm near what Kenny or Robert has, but I think one of the properties I have, and I don't know all the tenants because we have properties out of state and syndications, but the ones that we own personally, um, one of them is uh, a retired uh, lady whose husband passed away from cancer. He was an Air Force vet, and it was the home they built. And that home was about to be foreclosed on that, a predatory loan. And I went in and I wrote a check for that house and I bought it with cash. And I says, let's get this out of the control of the bank. And I rented it back to her for the same payment she needed. She got to keep her house. Now it's my house now, but it's her garden. It's her pictures on the wall. It's her secure feeling. And she never has to worry about having the rent raised as long as she lives, ever. It, she's, she, inflation doesn't affect her now because I'm going to take care of her. Right. Um, I have another house that has a single mom in there with three kids trying to make it happen. We keep that rent as stable as we can. And so I feel I'm giving value to the people. That it's just, I don't feel like I'm Burger Meister, Meister Burger, uh, just misering you know, an asset. Ooh, it puts money in my pocket. I think there's some value there. Well, when it comes to stocks, let's talk about what a stock is. I mean, if I were to ask you, what is a stock? You've taken the four pillars class. Um, what do you think stock is? I would say it's a sliver of ownership of a business. Yeah, it's like a pizza. You know, you cut it up into shares and you share the pizza. And so someone starts a business. I have private businesses that are not publicly for sale, but they still – when you incorporate, they say, how many shares of this business? Mine has 50,000, right? I pull the number. It could have been two, could have been 10. We just said 50,000. So when Marcy gets smart and the bigger, better deal comes along, which I don't, can't believe she must not see him because they're there every day. When she decides to execute that exit strategy in some of those businesses, she has 25,000 shares and I have 25,000 shares and she can take her shares and off she goes. So, yeah, it's ownership of a business. Now, let's think about that for a minute. And let's talk about owning stock as a business. Warren Buffett, who I think is the greatest investor of all time. Now, Bezos has more money than he does now. And so does Gates. They're both businesses. But those guys are entrepreneurs. Um, as far as investing goes, I think Buffett's the top of the food chain because his business is buying other businesses, right? That's what Berkshire does is it's, a holding company. And he's basically been very shrewd in buying not little pieces of paper, but buying companies. And I'll tell you what he said on CNBC uh, just a month or two ago, a couple months ago, he, uh, they asked him about Apple and he owns a ton of Apple. I mean, a lot. And he said, I don't think of Apple as a stock. I think of Apple as our third largest business. The largest business he has is Geico. That's a huge business and that's not for sale. He, he owns all the shares of that, all of them, Berkshire okay. does. Uh, BASF, I believe a railroad is probably his second business and Apple is the third largest business he has. And it might even be bigger than that now that Apple's so high, it might be you know like 42% of, of what he's got now, at least in, in the stuff he invests in shares. 
So he said this, he says, I don't look at it as a stock. I look at it as our third largest business. That's an important point because since Geico has no stock price, how does that cash flow? In other words, how does he make any money? This is what I would say in very humble because is Uncle Frank older or younger than you or same age? <laughs> He's quite a bit older. Quite a bit older. So we'll be respectful. With all respect, Uncle Frank, um, you know, how does Warren Buffett count Geico as his largest business? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, that business gives value to customers. They give a fair price. They insure motorcycles. They insure cars. Their uh, commercials at times can be entertaining, but not usually. <laughs> but they do give some value. They give some peace of mind. You know what? If someone wrecks their car, they'll pay it. They'll pay it. And they, uh, there's value in insurance. I'm grateful for the people that provide insurance. People say, oh, those rich insurance companies. Okay, let them Fine, no insurance. What happens when your home burns down? I just like the peace of mind knowing that when I leave, if this place burns down, I'll be compensated. And they basically have taken all the risk off my hands. You know, if I have a car and I total it, that, that's their risk, not mine, because it's insured. So that's value. That's not just manipulating little pieces of paper. That's value. And if Geico doesn't have a stock price, if it doesn't have a stock price, then how – how does he make money if he doesn't cash flow it? Well, the answer is he does. And the word we use with a non-stock business is the word distribution. So you've had businesses, Greg, uh, I have, I've had businesses and the largest uh, portion of my income comes from distributions, not the salary I pay myself. Right. Absolutely. I pay myself a, a salary that is, fair, right? So the IRS doesn't come after me. Right. But if we uh, have a distribution, that's a, that's a big amount of cash flow that comes. Well, I don't know. Big is a relative word. To Bezos, it wouldn't be big. So right, right. to me, I think it's big. Uh, I should say significant. It's meaningful to me, right? And so when uh, cash flow means money's moving and uh, cash flow is based on your bank account, you have assets, uh, the balance sheet, right? You have the balance sheet, assets, and liabilities. You have the income statement, which is your operations. And then you have a statement of cash flow. And your statement of cash flow discusses three other statements. It discusses the income uh, that comes in and out of the balance or of the uh, income statement. That's called operational cash flow. So that's cash flowing. You have asset cash flow, which is investment cash flow. That shows what goes in and out of the asset column. And then you have uh, financial cash flow, which is debt, what goes in and out. So if I borrow money, that's cash flow in to my bank account. If I pay off a debt, cash flow goes out. If I buy an asset, cash flows out. If I sell the asset, cash flows in. And if I have operational cash flow and my, my expenses are less than my income, I'm going to have cash flowing in. So that's what cash flow is. So when you say, can you cash flow the stock market? Let's begin with Warren Buffett and Geico. They have customers. Those customers pay for value. Um, if they don't have too many claims, then they're going to have premiums that, that create profit and they can take distributions. So, um, so that's his largest business. Now let's look at Apple and, and the pro and I understand the problem, Greg is the problem is wall street and high frequency trading that, you know, kind of takes away this idea that, that we have 80% of our stock market volume now is done automatically, not even a human involved. It's all electronic, 80% of it now. And some of this is done in nanoseconds or microseconds or whatever those tiny little seconds are. And there's probably not a big fundamental change, meaning fundamental analysis in, you know, the snap of a finger. I mean, Geico didn't change much right there to there. Well, Geico is not being traded all the time, but Apple is. And so when you can trade in microseconds and fractions of pennies, um, you know, I get it. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's buy low, sell high in these little increments. The 401k doesn't cash flow 
And so people think, well, how big is my 401k? And they think it in terms of buying low and the growth of the stock price. Right. But I will tell you one of the most underappreciated aspects of being a stock owner is your potential for distributions. But they don't call them a distribution, they call them a dividend, which is the same thing. Think of it, if you and, and I and a bunch of friends were playing cards, what would you do? You'd take out the deck and you would distribute or you would divide the cards. It's the same thing. Distributing the cards amongst five guys, dividing the cards amongst five guys is the same thing. So uh, real estate, for example, when, uh, when I have real estate, it's as a business and I have two types. I have um, maybe an entity where I own a single family home that I rent and that's its own entity. Well, if, I want, if they pay rent, I wanna pull some of that money out and spend it, I take a distribution. And there's only you know two shareholders, me and my wife, right? Right. Um, the other ones are syndications where there's a ton of investors. I mean, these are you know hundred million, fifty million dollar projects. So a lot of us band together, and when rents are paid, they distribute that rent to us monthly in in cash flow. So what's the difference between Geico, Apple, and uh, rental property at a high level? There is none. They're all businesses. They just sell different stuff. On the high level, yeah. I can tell you that, that uh, Uncle Frank told me that the dividends are pennies and they don't even count. Well, Benjamin Franklin once said, and he's older than all of us, a penny saved, a penny earned. I disagree uh, with that because I believe in inflation. You see... The reason real estate is cool is, is I believe as the dollar loses value, uh, rent's going to cost more. Now, certainly my maintenance will cost more. Certainly uh, the insurance on the home will cost more, but the cash flow will increase as the dollar loses value. I feel the same way about a can of Coca-Cola. Yeah, it's going to cost more to put it together, but it's, we're going to charge a lot more in the vending machine and the cash flow is going to be there. And so, I understand what Uncle Frank is saying. If I were to bring up, you know, any stock right now, uh, you're going to see anywhere from 1% to 6%. You know, maybe you got, you know, I was looking at Prudential today. They're paying like a 6.8% dividend based on their price today. So here's Prudential, which is insurance and Geico, right? It's the same business. Right. They're paying about a 6.8% dividend all the way down to, you know, Coca-Cola, who's paying about a 3% dividend. But here's what we, we want to consider. When I started my personal business, it was very, very small. We started it with my business partner. We started it with zero money, absolutely none. And we each had a credit card and, and we said, well, let's buy a website and start doing stuff on business. And so we spent a couple thousand bucks on a credit card. And next thing you know, uh, we had business. So we, re we literally started with none of our own money. We used credit cards uh, to do everything. None, no money left our pocket at any time. And uh, that was pretty special to start with nothing. Well, the distributions at that time were pretty small, uh, you know, pretty meager, but over time they get larger if the business does well. So if you look at stock as a business, and that would be a great title for this podcast, investing in stocks as a business with a business mentality. Um, Warren Buffett purchased uh, his, share, his first shares of Coca-Cola in 1985. And his average cost basis for all the Coke he's purchased is about $3.25. Now I'd imagine back in 1985, I don't even know if Coke paid a dividend back then, but back then it was probably three cents a share, four cents a share of those pennies. Now their dividend is like $1.48, something like that. I could look it up and get it exact. I guess we should. Um, KO dividend. I'll just look it up here on my computer real quick. It's $1.64. Excuse me. I was off. $1.64. So think about this for a moment. If Warren Buffett is receiving $1.64 for every share he owns, and he bought those shares at $3.25 on average, that's a 50.46% uh, return every year on his money, just on the dividend. Yeah. 
That's 50% a year. That means that he's getting his whole shares paid for uh, every two years. He's an infinite return, right? He's, he's had all that money paid back. And that, he's got a lot of shares, but here's the thing. There's the dividend yield, but then there's the investor yield. And, and sure, a person in any business has an eye of faith. And when I started my business, it was an eye of faith if, if they did do well. When I, when I started my real estate investing career, it was with an eye of faith that we'll do better in the future than we're doing right now. And if I just started my business and my first distribution <clears throat> was going to be a forecast of what all the distributions would be, I wouldn't get in the business either. Right. I wouldn't. But see, we're, we're taking this as a business standpoint. I will tell you that in a literal sense, Coca-Cola has IP, inter, you know, intellectual property. They have, uh, they have their secret sauce, their recipes. They have workers. They have a, a workforce that is trained. They have factories. They have trucks and distri- they call it a distribution company, a bottling company. They have manufacturing. Um, that's a real asset. That's real stuff. That's not a piece of paper. And Warren Buffett, when you take the attitude of buying a company, believing its dividend will increase, that means you bought it low, but over many years, that dividend will increase. I bet if we looked and invited Uncle Frank to dinner, you know, a nice friendly dinner, we could look at, if he's older than me, I'm a half century old, so I remember 1985. Um, I'll bet the dividend grew significantly, but Warren Buffett's cost did not. That's real key because he paid for it once. Right, right. His cost did not increase. And because he invests well and has a good tax, you know, I'm sure he has a great tax guy. I mean, he's going to pay some taxes. But that's a great idea. And, and you know, you look at Apple – uh, it doesn't cash flow a lot right now relative to its $300 price. But Buffett bought it not too long ago, like 2016, I want to say, like four years ago. Buffett bought it, and uh, and he uh, he bought it, I think, at 144 something like that, 150 bucks. So he bought it half price ago. So as their profits grow and that dividend increases – his cost does not, and the cash flow becomes actually quite significant. In the so case I, of Coke, it's 50%. Can I interrupt you then? So generally we talk about investing and, and getting educated and knowledge, and we we tend to pull back away from speculating. But it yeah. sounds like there's a, a big I still, part of I still, in, I still indulge once in a while, but yeah, uh, the core stuff, no, yeah. But Warren Buffett here, I mean, the success stories here, yeah, he got the dividend, but it's the speculating that the dividend was going to grow that made it such a great story today. Is that is that a big part of when you focus on dividends to learn? It how is. To I mean, the first pit, we have four pillars we talk about often. The first one's fundamental analysis. And right. fundamental analysis um, looks at a couple of things. For Buffett and Graham, you know, Benjamin Graham, they talked a lot about growth. Um, what's its traje- trajectory? You know, is it growing? And then it talks a lot about earnings. You know, is the thing earning money now? It's, it's a little bit more of a pipe dream to say, well, someday we'll make some money. Um, and those pay off big when they do, but they have higher risk. So he likes to say, hey, let's get proof of concept. Um, there's a few people. I, I was excited for my little business. I mean, we, one, of our, one of our businesses is we uh, offered stock education and we went to Vietnam and uh, we had like 100, 100 students want to be a part of our academy, and they don't even speak English. And what I know is, is that's a good enough sampling that I know that if there's 100 people in Vietnam interested on our first go around, you know, there's probably 1,000, maybe 10,000 potentially interested, right? So I have an eye of faith in that, in that, whoop, in that proof of concept, right? Oh, excuse right, me, right. I forgot to turn my phone off. But... Uh, but that's a big deal, right? Is you're right. Fundamental analysis. So I would say, Uncle Frank, here's the deal. Warren Buffett, let's let's pull him into a meeting with Warren Buffett. And let's take Buffett to dinner too. And he says, you know, Uncle Frank, I kind of like you. I'll tell you what, I'm going to leave you and name you as a beneficiary of my uh, trust beyond the grave. In other words, when I die, I'll make you a beneficiary. But here's the only thing. You can't sell my Coca-Cola stock 
but you can enjoy uh, any portion of the cash flow from that that it gives, and you get to choose. I think he'd take the deal. I don't think he'd look at Warren and say, oh, you can't cash flow stocks, therefore that, that's not a good offer for me. In fact, that offer would make him a millionaire uh, like that fast because there is cash flow. And, and so that's an important thing. Now, what do you count as cash flow? Let's go two more levels with this. Um, do you, have you ever heard of, there's, there's a company called Toll Brothers. Have you ever heard of Toll Brothers? Uh, no. They are, Toll Brothers, T-O-O-L Brothers, is a major, major, major construction company, okay? And Toll Brothers builds beautiful homes. I'm looking, if you go to their website, tollbrothers.com, you'll see a beautiful home on the website, and, and there it is, Toll Brothers. So is Toll Brothers a real business? Absolutely. So well, what do they do? Build homes. They flip homes. They take, they take raw materials and combine them together to make it worth more than it was before, right? The concrete was, there's no atoms being invented here. There was concrete over here and there were shingles over here and there was a can of paint over here and all, and there was a piece of land over here and all that stuff was worth X amount to buy it. And then they did some stuff to it and then they uh, sold, sold homes. They've been doing this for a long, long time. And when they sell a home, there's a margin there. And because they do this well on a regular basis, they've been in business for a long, long time. And even a guy who hates flipping like Kenny McElroy, well, Kenny McElroy, he does development. He just holds it and rents it instead of sell, selling it. So Toll Brothers is a real business. They just flip houses. They call it development, okay? I have a friend named Than Merrill who's flipped about a thousand houses in his day. He does about a hundred a year, but here's the difference. He's not some idiot out there with no education. He's got systems. He's got marketing. He's got know-how. He's got relationships. And you know what he does is he doesn't do development. He does redevelopment. In other words, he takes all those parts and he does some stuff to them and increases the value and sells it sometimes. He also rents. So he has a company called CT Homes. They've been in business for 12, 15 years, something like that. That's a real business. It's cash flowed every year. It's cash flowed in the down times. Some of his best times were 2007 and eight. And so if you were to do the same thing as a stock, um, then you've got a guy who solved the market called Jim Simons. Jim Simons started a business. It's registered, it has a, a, uh, it's a real hedge fund. But he took the opposite approach from Buffett and he bought low and sold high and he, he counted that as cash flow. And yeah, it's capital gain, but cash flowed into his account. Remember, a statement of cash flow has three things. Operational cash flow, which would be rent, investment cash flow, which would be buying or selling the asset, or third is investment or financial cash flow is when you borrow money. So you can cash flow from any of those three standpoints and stock investors, uh, if you look at their statement of cash flow, if they buy a stock low and sell it high, you'll see cash flowing into their account and that is cash flow. So that's an interesting uh, way to, to think about it uh, as well is you can, uh, buying low and selling high is a form of cash flow. It's not my favorite, it's not the, what we teach at Rich Dad by and large, we like the idea of having a of not having to play that game of guessing. Uh, I think that's a wise thing. I think Rich Dad has established themselves as pretty wise for saying, hey. "Look, endure the ups and downs of Coca Cola, and get the dividend because long term probably does well." Okay, endure the ups and downs of the real estate market, but just collect your rent during the whole time, right, right, and get the cash flow. It's not buy, hope, and pray. We don't buy and hold real estate in hoping the price of the real estate goes up. We buy and hold real estate because the rents will come in over a long period of time and the rents will get bigger. We don't buy and hold Coca-Cola hoping the stock price will go up. We buy and hold Coca-Cola hoping they'll sell more drinks 10 years from now than they did today. Does that right. make sense? Yeah, yeah, I explain it to my, to my family members as um, I'm a lazy investor. 
I don't want to have to keep finding the new house. Yeah. To make. I want to only find one house and just keep making my money off it. There's some truth to that. There's like, some real truth to that. Um, the only way a person should really flip houses is if they enjoy it. Some people enjoy that ugly to beautiful, bringing the new family. That it gets them off. Me, not so much. Um, I I enjoy a little bit of speculation in the stock market. I truly do. I had a choice experience. I mentioned to you that my we we decided to homeschool my son this next year, uh, between eighth and ninth grade, and I thought you know, why wait till the fall? If we're going to do it, we're not on the school schedule anymore. We can learn whenever we want to. So we actually started in the summer and we've been doing summer school. And it was fun because yesterday I'm sitting, he, my, this is the, this is the Captain Kirk chair. See, this is, this is where you drive. This is where you drive the enterprise from, right? This is the Captain Kirk chair. So my son is in the Captain Kirk chair and I'm back here in Spock's chair you know, doing this thing. And I, and I just watched my boy uh, set up alerts on every single position that, that I have real stuff, not a paper trade account, real stuff And how does he... learning. And I'm watching him over his shoulder learning real stuff. So is that work? I don't know. We kind of have fun with it. So work is a relative thing. And I do like a little speculation. We have the core stuff that we buy and want the dividend. And, you know, we want to do same thing Warren Buffett did with Coke. And here's the beautiful part about it is uh, I can't like take my degree from college and pass it to my son. And, you know, all the jobs I ever had, you know, I, I did carpentry. I was a rough framer. Uh, you know, did a lot of different types of jobs. I can't leave those to my son. What's interesting is the assets that I'm buying now, I can bequeath to my son. We can do it in special trusts in the family trust where he's a beneficiary and we don't have a lot of problems in taxation and stuff. And my sons can be stewards of those little machines that crank out the cash flow. And just imagine when you think generationally about the cash flow. Yeah, it's a pittance, you know, it's a pittance, it's pennies on the dollar. What about to my great, 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 great grandson? Because I think we'll still be addicted to Coca-Cola by the time I have a great, great grandson, at least two greats, you know, at least two. And the dividends that those stocks will likely pay that great, great grandpa Andy bought, that will be significant cash flow when you think in terms of legacy. So there's a lot of things to think about when we talk about dividends and there's a lot of things to think about when you think about people who have a business buying. So in the hedge funds are businesses that buy low, sell high and the cash flow comes to the investors. It comes in the form of a distribution. Right. So you can cash flow the stock market. And then third, we haven't talked about this is uh, I have an insurance business and my son is learning about that. Um, I you know, we rolled some options today. And we had a meeting this morning. My son, you know, helped me roll these options at 14 years old. And so uh, an option is when I make a promise. So I make people promises all the time and they pay me for those. And just like insurance, a premium, they make you a promise. Oh, your house burns down. I promise you, we'll pay you. Good, good. Here's your premium. So I can not only cash flow stocks with the dividend, but if I decide, you know what? You give me an offer I can't refuse. You know, maybe the stock's $100 today and you offer me $110. I'm like, you think it's going to go up 10% in a month? If that happens, I'll sell it to you. Well, then you pay me a premium. Well, where does that money go? It flows to me. That's called cash flow. The cash flows to me. And I love to do that just outside of their reach. Right, absolutely. Just outside of their reach, you know. Oh, it, get, it went to 108 Went from 100 to 100. I get the eight dollar gain. I says, "Hey, you want to buy for 110?" No, nah, not if it's 108. Well, I keep the premium. So you know, there's many ways to cash flow the stock market, um, and one of them is investing. Uh, and think of this as a business. Go back to Geico, Fruit of the Loom, Dairy Queen, some of Warren Buffett's companies that are not for sale. Seas Candies. These companies are not for sale. They're not shared among the public. They're not public. So does Warren Buffett get up in the morning and say, gee, I guess I better sell my company because that's the only way to make money in it. No, 
He says, let's sell some candy at Seize Candies. We'll sell Andy a Blizzard. We'll sell him some Duracell batteries. Uh, we'll sell him some Fruit Loom underwear and Geico. Think about that. Warren Buffett's got my money. I mean, I got Duracell batteries sitting right here. And, and when I bought this Duracell battery, that cash flow went to Warren Buffett. Right. And just because Duracell is not publicly traded doesn't mean it doesn't cash flow as a business. And yet I have an iPhone here, another uh, business that Buffett owns, and he did cash flow that through a dividend. Uh, it doesn't matter what the stock price is. So, okay. so there you have so it. I got one comment and one question for you. Yes. One of the comments that you kind of hinted to, you didn't use these words though, is possibly when you're interested in dividend investing, you need to also be able to have delayed gratification because it's possible that the real rewards come decades, years, decades later, when, the, when then the ratio really looks like a brilliant move. It sounds like that's- yeah, I'm not that lot. patient. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I teach in my course, The Four Pillars Investing, I use Kraft Heinz as an example. Kraft Heinz has too much debt on their balance sheet, blah, 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 but I'll tell you, I love that company because I just love ketchup. And I think, regardless of their debt situation, you're going to have Kraft macaroni and cheese and Heinz ketchup and Orida potato chips and, you know, Orida French fries. I mean, they have, they have like tons of Philadelphia cream cheese. They have, they're the fourth largest food company in the world, I believe. I just think they're going to be around. And what I did, Greg, is, yeah, I bought some of that, but I also used that options thing. So I double dipped. So I did get immediate gratification because I had $5 per share of option money from selling puts to acquire it before I even started. So Uncle Frank, what that means in English is if that stock was $20 when it fell, 20 bucks when I was trying to buy it, and I've already got $5 cash flow, my cost basis now is 15 bucks, let's say, just for numbers. Okay? Right, right. It's actually right now about 36, and I think we own it probably in the teens somewhere is where that is. So because I brought in cash flow from selling options, I got paid to buy it. Think about that. I not only get cash flow once I own it, I got cash flow because I got paid to buy it. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's immediate, gra that's a, that's a immediate gratification. This is a family show, so I won't say it's <laughs> like having an orgasm. I won't say that. Oh, yeah, don't but say it is immediate gratification when you, boom, when you just get that hit right there and, and, and next thing you know. So I love to double dip that game. And it does, it's not like, you, you know, any, can, any, er, no, this is what I hear. Not everyone can do that, which is back to your point. Exactly. Not everyone can do it. Right. All right. Yeah. Last, not last everyone question. could, but not everyone can. And that's different. No, like you said on one of our first shows, do I have my aunt, somebody do this? No, because she hasn't been educated how to do this. There you go. Education there is you. always the word that comes back on this podcast. What a great conversation, Greg. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy. I really, really appreciate it. You and your brilliance. Invest as a business. All right. Thanks, man. Cash we'll flow. talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.